All right, y'all, it's Friday, so let's just kick back and have some fun. This is going to be a long one, I think. This is 101 facts about Europe. Should be pretty awesome. It's from the channel of the same name. It's going to be linked in the description down below, so you can watch this whole thing uninterrupted. Of course, browser channel is a good one. So uh, I would grab a drink and a snack, perhaps. That's what I have ready. And uh, let's just jump straight into this. I think we're going to learn a lot. Number one, Europe is one of four, five, six, or seven continents of the world, depending on how you're defining continents. True. It's either its very own continent, part of Eurasia, that's Europe and Asia, or if you want to be really particular about it, it's part of Afro-Eurasia, which is Africa, Europe, and Asia. Wow. For the purposes of my own sanity, we'll say this. So I've heard of Eurasia. I know that's recognized by certain places. I've never heard of Afro-Eurasia. That's like almost the whole world as like one thing. Whoa. That's very, um, an interesting way of looking at it. Hmm. Seven and Europe's one of those. Happy? Don't care. Number two. Setting an exact border for Europe is difficult, but it's fair to say that it's bordered by the Atlantic Ocean in the west, the Arctic Ocean in the north, and the Mediterranean Sea to the south. That's a pretty definite border, what with the sea not being a country unless you're Aquaman. <laughs> Number three. On the east side, we've got Asia, which is separated yeah. by Europe by the Ural Mountains, the River Ural all the way down to the Caspian Sea, the Manic Valley to the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea, and last but not least, the Turkish Straits, which sounds like a barbershop quartet. Number four. Now, that's definitely above my head, right? I'm not going to weigh in on that. I'm not a border expert, but uh, I tell you what, I have heard that's like a very disputable thing, like where is that eastern border of Europe and then where does Asia start, right? So, there yeah, are 50 sure it differs. countries in Europe, or at least partially in Europe, or which could be interpreted as European. That doesn't include another six countries that are for all intents and purposes independent, but aren't recognized as such by most other countries. The most famous of these is probably Kosovo. Mm. Number five. The biggest country in Europe is Russia, which is no surprise since at 17.1 million square kilometers, it's the Huge. biggest country in the world. Yeah. However, only 23% of that sits in Europe. Right. Russia is also the biggest European country by population with 143 million people, but this time the proportions are swapped, and 23% of Russians live in the Asian part of the country. I was going to say, Russia is absolutely huge, most of it's in Asia, but most of that population is in the far western part of Russia, right, which does lie in Europe. Like, Moscow is a European country, would that be fair to... Or, oh my god. Moscow is a European city. Would that be fair to say? I think so. Number six. Europe is, at 10.2 million square kilometers, actually smaller than Russia. And if you want to be pedantic, wow. the largest country that's entirely Europe is Ukraine, which comes in at 604 square kilometers. That's oh, more than that's six right. times smaller than the bit of Russia in Europe. The take-home here, basically... Ukraine Russia is pretty big. big. Number seven. Europe is also home to the world's smallest country, Vatican City. It's mm. just 0.44 square kilometers and is home to 825 people, including that Pope guy. Of the 10 smallest countries wow. on Earth, five are in Europe. The other ones, by the way, are Monaco, San Marino, Liechtenstein, and Malta. Very Number cool. Eight. 745 million people live in Europe, making it the third biggest continent on the planet in terms of people. Africa is the next largest with 1.3 billion people, and Asia takes the crown with 4.6 oh billion people. 4.6 billion? Europe in, also in has Asia? the third biggest economy of all the continents, generating just over $20 trillion in 2020. North America takes the silver medal with... $20 trillion, that's, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> $24 trillion, and Asia is once that's again in the top spot with $32 trillion. Wow, Number holy 10. crap. Around $15.6 trillion of that European wealth is generated by the European Union, which is a political and economic union of 28, I mean, sorry, 27 European countries. The EU does not have an official capital, but in practice, Brussels in Belgium serves as such. Number 11. Launched on the 1st of January 1999, the Euro is the closest the continent has to a standard currency. However, in practice, only 19 countries actually use it, and all of them are inside the EU. Number 19. The origins of the name Euro so not are not even clear. Though. Not even all the EU countries use the euro interesting there are a couple of theories except map pat has nothing to do with them in the ancient greek language <laughs> euris meaning wide and ops meaning face or eye were combined to europa which might have been used to describe europe's shoreline or mainland mm. number 13. an alternative version of europe's from. origin comes from greek mythology where europa was the daughter of the phoenician king who was abducted by zeus 
The Greek god, disguised as a bull, took Europa to Crete, and they had three kids together. Uh, how sweet. Number 14. <laughs> and the final origin theory comes from ancient Mesopotamia, where Europe is said to have derived their word Eribu, meaning sunset, since from ancient Mesopotamia's view, the sun did set on Europe. Interestingly, wow. the ancient Mesopotamian word for sunrise was Azu, and is also a potential candidate for the origin of the word Asia. Number 15. Interesting. It's been widely reported that 1 in 10 Europeans are conceived in an IKEA bed, ever since a 2011 New Yorker <laughs> article made the claim. Okay. IKEA was said to be investigating in 2016, but it's been four years now. Got anything yet, lads? So is IKEA pretty big deal in Europe then? Like, uh, is it in most of the countries? Obviously, IKEA around like Chicago area is really big. We have multiple IKEAs. They're huge stores. Everyone knows that they're Swedish, right? I think they're very uh, open about that, especially with the color choice. But yeah, it's a fascinating place. People go there, obviously, to furnish you know, their place. Or a lot of people just go there to kind of wander around. It is kind of like a, uh, just kind of a wonderland. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Europe is home to one of the two double landlocked countries on Earth. Liechtenstein is snugly tucked away between Austria and Sun Sunderland, Switzerland, both of which are also landlocked. FYI, Uzbekistan is the other one, so don't go to either of those places if you like the coast. <laughs> Number 17. The oldest parliament in the world is known as the All Thing and was founded in Thingvellir, Iceland, way back in 930 AD. It wow. met annually until 1798 before being temporarily abolished but made a comeback in 1845 over in Reykjavik. Number 18. Europe can also claim the world's longest continuously operating parliament, the Tynwald, which sits on the Isle of Man. Whoa. This self-governing dependency of the British Crown has had a parliament in operation since 979, with Jeez. no breaks in service. As an aside, by the way, it was also the first national parliament to give women the vote in 1881. Number 19. Wow, that's and pretty while fascinating. while we're on a parliament flex, the biggest parliament building physically resides in Romania, and it's an absolute whopper. It's 360,000 square metres in area, has 12 storeys, 1,100 rooms, and 20,000 parking spaces. It holds the record as the world's heaviest building. 700,000 oh. tons of steel. Oh my god, look at that. What is going on? And bronze with 3,500 tons of crystal glass, along with 1 million cubic metres of marble and 900,000 cubic metres of wood. Number 20. Jeez. Belarus is considered by many observers to be the last dictatorship in Europe. Alexander Lukashenko has been president of the country since 1994, although there were widespread protests against his rule in 2020. Number 21. Wow. Only two European countries have not abolished the death penalty, Russia and Belarus. However, Russia has hit pause on doing so, and the last execution there took place in 1999. Number 22. Ooh, ooh. That's pretty the weird, right? Considering, from my perspective, just because I don't remember how many, uh, but there are considerable amount not maybe not a considerable amount but there are a few states here in the u.s that still have the death penalty um actually the day i'm recording this um maybe I, I can put like a graphic here showing uh i i believe the state of alabama just did a execution like yesterday or something with like a new method or something so yeah Pretty weird that uh, some states still do that in the US. Highest and longest mountain range located entirely in Europe, because I knew you were wondering, are the Alps, which run for 1,200 yeah. kilometers, and the highest peak is Mont Blanc at 4,809 meters. The Alps are so extensive they run across eight European countries Jeez. Austria, France, Germany, Italy, Liechtenstein, Monaco, Slovenia, and Switzerland. Wow, that's amazing. Number 23. Wow. But wait, because Mont Blanc is not the highest point in all of Europe. That honour goes to Mount Elbrus in the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, it stands at 5,642 wow. metres, only 64% as tall as Mount Everest, and technically, it's a dormant volcano. Oh. Number 24. That's scary The only active volcano <laughs> on the European mainland is Mount Vesuvius, which famously erupted in 79 AD and destroyed the Roman city of Pompeii, which mm. gave Kit Harrington a movie, so I guess it was worth it. Today, it's considered one of the most dangerous in the world since so many people live nearby. Mm. Three million to be precise, with 600,000 thought to be under serious threat next time it erupts. That's freaky. The last freaky. time it did so was in 1944. Number 25. Yeah, volcanoes are one of those things that are just freaky, right? The fact that, yeah, we, you know, some people live by them, but there's just always that chance. There's always that, that back of your head, like, what if that erupts? <laughs> How bad is this going to be? It's going to be pretty bad. Um, we in the U.S. have that same fear. Uh, you know, super volcano in Yellowstone, maybe you've heard of it. 
Yeah, if that erupts, we're in we're in big trouble. Right. <laughs> States All away, jets, though, too. Volcano like, nerds, yeah. we're not done because the most active and biggest volcano in Europe is Mount Etna at 3,320 meters Jeez. on the island of Sicily. Shots of its lava oh, were combined wow. with CGI effects to make the planet of Mustafa in Revenge of the Sith, so it must have a nice look to it. Nice. <laughs> Number 26. Sweden, Finland and Norway are in the top three countries in the world if you're a fan of islands. Norway has around 55,000, Finland has 180,000 wow. and Sweden has 267,000. Of those, more than a quarter of a million Swedish islands, only 984 are actually inhabited. So a boat there is basically essential. Number 27. That's amazing that there's that many. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of islands just in those three countries. And there's so many that obviously aren't inhabited. It's it's really funny because we think of that the fact that there's billions of people on Earth. But yet there's so many places, whether it be, you know, big parts of mainlands, other, you know, and then, of course, uh, islands and such. There's so many places on Earth that are just ghost towns, right? A ghost town is, I'm not using it literally, but I'm saying that, you know, there's just no one there. It's fascinating that you could still get away from, from people and, you know, easier than you think, honestly. The world's shortest scheduled flight takes place in the Orkney Islands in Scotland. The 1.7 mile flight between Westray and Papa Westray what? usually takes two minutes, but the record is just 47 seconds. Why do they fly <laughs> for two minutes please tell me that flight is like one dollar or one what what would it be one pound or that's hilarious what uh, please enlighten me on that number 28 <laughs> europe's biggest lake can be found in you guessed it russia lake ladoga located not too far from st petersburg is 17,700 square kilometers the Jeez. vatican city could fit on top of it over 40,000 times though they probably shouldn't do that Although they could get a lot more baptisms done. <laughs> Number 29. Jeez, what the, the formation the hell of the European Union dates back to 1957 and the Treaty of Rome, which led to the creation of the European Economic Community. There were six founding members, Belgium, France, West Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Number 30. Only one country has ever left the EU, and that's us, the United Kingdom, uh. which held a referendum on membership in 2016, with 52% of the population deciding to leave. No further comments. Wow. Number 31. That's wild. However, other countries have left the EEC slash EU. Algeria, for example, which joined as part of France, but then left on independence in 1962. Hmm. Greenland, which left in 1985 after 53% of the population voted to leave. And in 2012, saint Barthélemy, an overseas collective Whoa. of France, decided to vote to leave. And in 2012... Wait, Green Greenland was part of the EEC or EU? I don't know what it would have been. Greenland, which left in 1985 after 53% of the population voted to leave. Wow, that's interesting just because as a geography perspective, isn't Greenland in North America? That's pretty pretty funny. I know it's owned by or something, right? Uh, it's like a territory. I, I, you know what? I don't want to misspeak because I don't know the terminology because I, I don't know for a fact. I want to say it's Denmark, something to do with them. But that's funny, like... A, Obviously, they're not part of it, it sounds like now, but it would be funny to think like of part of North America as part of the EU, in theory. That's pretty and funny. in 2012, saint Barthélemy, an overseas collective of France, decided to leave too. Number 32. On the topic of Greenland, the largest island on Earth, it's geographically part of North America, but its political connections there are we European. Are. There the we island are. has been part of the Danish Kingdom since 1721 and remained an autonomous... How funny that that was the next fact. <laughs> ...territory within that kingdom today. Wow. Number 33. That is the still bizarre. The origins of bizarre. the EU go back slightly earlier, to 1951 and the formation of the European Coal and Steel Community, where the same six countries who founded the EEC agreed to establish a central authority to regulate their coal industries. This giving up of power by national governments to a bigger organization is called supranationalism, and it was designed to foster cooperation and prevent war. You know, since there had been a lot of war in Europe up to that point. Number 34. There are 12 states in Europe that still have a monarchy, including the Vatican, whose king is the Pope. Not all the monarchs rule over the kingdoms as kings or queens, Andorra, Liechtenstein and Monaco are principalities, Luxembourg is a grand duchy, and the Vatican is a theocracy. Number 35. Most of the monarchies in Europe today are, you know, ceremonial, but the Vatican is home to the last absolute monarchy on the continent. He's wow. answerable to no other power in the country. He controls executive, legislative, and judicial powers. 
He's basically Palpatine. He is the Senate. That's crazy. Wow. You might associate the feudal system with medieval Europe, and you'd be right to do so. It was very popular back in the day, with landed lords ruling it over their vassals who worked the land for them. Let's just say that wasn't very democratic. What might surprise you is that the system lasted in Europe well into the 21st century. Sark, wow. for instance, one of the Channel Islands, didn't abolish it until 2008. Jeez, the Oh my in god. In the mid 20th century, areas of mainland Europe faced an epidemic of rabies in its red fox population. The solution, what? first used in Switzerland in the 1970s, was to airdrop thousands of severed chicken heads with vaccine tablets hid inside them for foxes to eat and vaccinate themselves. Number 38. Wow. It was so effective that in the end, 16 European countries took up the method. By the end, the Swiss were dropping 150,000 heads a year before switching to a different method in 1991. Maybe that's how we all get the COVID vaccine. That's crazy. That's a very fascinating method. Like, how do they even think of that? And it seems to have worked. Number 39. Wow. Before we go any further, let's address the elephant in the room. Yes, Europe is also the name of a Swedish band famous for producing arguably the greatest song of all time, The Final Countdown. The 1986 mega hit reached number one in 25 countries. Glad that's out the way. That's right. Number 40. In 2005, scientists at the University of Liverpool discovered that 10% of Europeans are resistant to HIV. This 10% carry a genetic mutation that's thought to have become more prevalent as a result of all the plagues in the Middle Ages. Although whether it was bubonic plague or smallpox that was responsible remains up for debate. Number 41. That's just bizarre. According to Brian Sykes, an Oxford University professor of human genetics, 99% of all Europeans can trace their origins back to just seven different women. His study, which used 6,000 samples of DNA, determined that the women arrived in Europe as long as 45,000 years ago. The meaning of life. <laughs> Most of the world, in fact around 66% of the population, are lactose intolerant and generally lose the ability to digest milk comfortably by the age of five. That's not so in Europe though, or those descended from Europeans. In Central and Northern European countries, the opposite is true, and between 70 to 90% of people can enjoy drinking milk long into adulthood. This wow. lactose tolerance only developed around 12,000 years ago, remarkably fast in human evolutionary terms. Is that common? throughout different uh, countries in Europe to drink milk regularly as an adult. Um, I can't speak really, I guess, for the U.S. because it's so big. And I, I don't know if people do that here at normally. I'm not really sure. Uh, I know me in my immediate circle, no, it's not common. And I can't. You know, of course, I drank milk as a kid, but if I drink straight up milk, it's, um, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> that wrecks my stomach big time. Now, of course, you know, to an extent, I may consume things with dairy in it, but drinking straight up milk, no, that doesn't happen. Number 43. Hmm. Tsar Simeon II was the last king of Bulgaria and sat on the throne between 1943 and 1946, even though he was just a mere child. When the communists took over the country after World War II, the monarchy was abolished and he lost his title. Oh. 45 years later, he won the country's <laughs> election and was elected prime minister instead. There you go. Number 44. Who's the best and the toughest out of all the Europeans, huh? Ooh. Well, this one where you may be thinking, French armed forces are historically the most successful in European history. According okay. to an historian, Niall Ferguson, out of the 168 conflicts they've fought in, they've won 109, drawn 10, and lost 49. Hmm. Number 45. The largest city in Hard Europe is, numbers. drum roll, blah, 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 Istanbul, with a population of around 15 million people. Whoosh. But the city is slap bang on the border between Europe and Asia. Yeah. Which means some of those people live in the non-European part of the city. Number 46. That's... That means that... That, again, geography, right? That's a very bizarre uh, situation for, like, Istanbul, right? It's right on the cusp. Uh, very interesting place, I bet. Technically, the largest city located entirely in Europe is... Drum roll, blah, 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 Moscow, with a population oh. of 12.5 million. Paris, London, and Madrid round out the rest of the top five. I would have guessed uh, Paris or London. I forgot about Moscow, yeah. Hmm. Five. Number 47. More than 100 vampire skeleton graves have been found across Bulgaria. The practice, where the dead are buried with iron rods through their chest to prevent them from coming back to life, dates back to the Middle Ages but was practiced as recently as the 1900s. Number 48. Odyssey the Iceman is perhaps one of the most best preserved mummies ever discovered and certainly one of the oldest. 
with his remains dating back between 3100 and 3370 BC. Jeez. Well, he died at the grand old age of 46, which was old for the time. Yeah. His body was frozen in ice in the North Italian Alps, cap style, before being discovered more than 5,000 years later in 1991. Oh my god. Number 49. Otzi has revealed a lot about Copper Age life in the region, including that tattoos must have been really popular since he had around 60 of them. They what? weren't made using a needle though, but by rubbing charcoal into cuts on the skin. Number 50. Wow. Only four countries drive from the left-hand side of the road in Europe. They're the UK, Ireland, which was once part of the UK, and Malta and Cyprus, mm. both former UK colonies. They're also all islands. The whole of mainland uh. Europe is right-hand drive. So... Number 51. Like, uh, it was funny. I don't know why. I guess maybe from, like, media, because naturally, you know, stuff from around the world to some extent is shown on US TV. <laughs> now, naturally, some media from around the world is, you know, shown in the US. Like, a lot of, I think, uh, British media, right? From, like, the UK, BBC is shown here, all that stuff. And so I assumed when I was a kid, I, I don't know why, just, you know, as a kid, kid logic, right? I thought, like, everywhere in Europe was that drove on the left in right hand drive cars. Um, which is funny to find out that really, no, only the UK and a couple other places, uh, and then Ireland, of course, does that. Whereas I don't know what the percentage would be, but it seems like 90 something percent of Europe actually drives like we do here in the US. I think that's pretty funny. And uh, it, it makes it travel a little less in intimidating, right? Now, of course, if you put me in the UK or Ireland, uh, it would be great. It'd be fun, but it would be a little bit intimidating, not going to lie, because you're driving somewhere else, different road rules, different cars, that kind of thing. And it's right-hand drive and you're on the other side of the road. That just freaks me out. As someone who loves driving, I just admit that I would be a little bit nervous for that, right? But it's good to know that most of Europe, it wouldn't be that drastic different. The origins of this divide are thought to be connected to France and Napoleon. Right-hand drive became the norm for the French during the revolution at the end of the 18th century. And then Napoleon went around conquering large swathes of the continent, but not Britain, taking right-hand traffic with him. Over time, the standard spread throughout Europe, except in the parts held by the Brits. Wow. Number 52. Question for and you, is the- Obviously, everyone, it's like the oldest debate ever. I prefer the way we drive, and then apparently most of Europe. Driving on the other side, ugh, like that sounds weird to me. Duracell <laughs> bunny pink, or is the Energizer bunny that color? The answer depends on whether you're European or American. Both companies use a pink bunny to sell their batteries, but after a trademark dispute between them was resolved in 1992, Energizer was allowed to use the bunny in America, and Duracell got Europe. Number 53. That's so weird. The queen in a game of chess was created in medieval Europe. Prior to this, the piece was known as the vizier and had a limited range of movement. Basically, it wasn't very good. According to some historians, the rise of Isabella I of the throne of Castile in 1474 was reflected by making this piece into the all-powerful queen we know today. Wow. Number 54. Lions used to roam around Europe and ancient Greece in particular less than 2,000 years ago. What? There are numerous references to lions by historians at the time, and the European lion was likely used by the Romans in gladiatorial combat. Holy crap. Number 55. One thing that appeared in Europe was the tomato, which was not native to the continent and was imported from the New World in around 1500. Hmm. For a few centuries, it had the nickname Poison Apple, because aristocrats would often get ill and die after eating them. Wow, that's, um, that's terrible. This wasn't your classic European superstition, though. The upper crust were actually dying because of the tomatoes. At the time, the wealthy used pewter plates to eat off. These contain lead, and when you put an acidic tomato on lead, it leaches oh. the dangerous material into itself. Turns out tomatoes that are contaminated with lead aren't very good for you. Number 57. I was sitting here wondering why the hell they were eating tomatoes and dying. That sounds ridiculous. That's why. That... It's always fun and, and very satisfying when you hear a scientific explanation that just nails it, right? That's weird. The first smoker in history is generally considered to be Rodrigo de Jerez, who brought uh, the habit back to Spain after traveling with Columbus. Upon his return, he was arrested by the Spanish Inquisition, who nobody expects really, for smoking in public and was accused of Satanism because oh. smoke came out of his nostrils. Uh, he served seven years for that. Number 58. Damn. The longest...
the most regretful cigarette in history, huh? <laughs> Seven years because of a of you know basically a lighting up a smoke. Place name in Europe Yikes. and the second in the world is Lampul. The, this this place in Wales, which is in the UK, which is in I've Europe. heard of that. There's plenty of funny places. Heard of that place? <laughs> that's like what twenty something letters. Europe, but fucking in Australia used to be called something that's rude and sounds very similar to that, and they've changed it to fucking starting from the first of January, twenty twenty one. Number 59. Europe changed By the way, I don't know if you caught it. I love how he... <laughs> I love how he showed the Austria thing and then said Australia because, um, yes, that's even a theme on my channel with certain viewers. It, it just cracks me up uh, how people mix up Austria and Australia. It's funny. I always get a kick out of it. 1582 from the Julian system introduced by Julius Caesar to the Gregorian calendar introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th. The problem with Jules' calendar was that it was 11 minutes and 14 seconds longer than the year, which meant the calendar drifted. Uh, yeah. Number 618. That would add up, huh? As a result of switching between the calendars and resetting the drift, it meant that the days between October the 5th through to October 14th, 1582, did not exist. Uh, it was first adopted in Italy, Spain, and Portugal, but Protestant countries held out for a bit longer. Britain, for example, didn't switch calendars until 1752. Wow. Number 61. That's pretty weird. San Marino. That would have been, like, very inconsistent for a time there between different countries <sighs> that might have that must have been a headache who can claim to be the oldest republic in the world with its origins stretching as far back as 301 ad yeah in 1600 a constitution laying out a parliamentary government was also put into place number 62 wow that's amazing almost all of europe's royal families are distantly related and trace one common ancestor back to king george ii of great britain and ireland who ruled from 1727 to 1760 the eight Jeez. royal families of Denmark, Luxembourg, Monaco, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and the UK are thus related by one old Geordie boy. Number 63. Whoa. Modern humans first arrived in Europe sometime between 55,000 BC and 35,000 BC. By the year 7000 BC, Europeans, if you can call them that, had adopted farming and were living in permanent settlements. Civilization as we know it today was born. Nintendo 64. For those wondering what had happened to the non-modern humans of Europe, the Neanderthals went extinct in the region about 30,000 to 40,000 years ago. Up to 4% of DNA in people of European and Asian ancestry comes from Neanderthals, and this Neanderthal inheritance has been linked to a higher risk of sunburn, greater risk of depression, and increased nicotine addiction. Uh. Number 65. Most of the notable early cultures of Europe were the Cucuteni Tripilia, who were knocking around in Eastern Europe from 5500 BC to 2750 BC. They're remarkable for building huge cities with populations of 10,000 people or more. Jeez, I, I can't even fathom what that would have been like. That is a long time ago. Like, how are they building cities? How does that even work? That's just, I can't even comprehend that. Number 66. What's unusual about the Cucuteni Tripilia is that every 60 to 80 years, they would burn their cities to the ground and move on to a new area and build a new one. One theory for this was that they believed in a cyclical world, since their settlements were built in concentric circles and their art was on big circles too. Number 67. Wow. Before we move on to the really famous ancient civilizations, let's give a shout out to the Minions. Sorry, the Minoans, I mean. Generally considered <laughs> Europe's first advanced civilization. From around 3000 BC to 1100 BC, the Minoans thrived on the island of Crete. Now sure, they had flourishing trade and their culture inspired the ancient Greeks, but the take home here is that they were rocking flushing toilets, the oldest in the world at 4,000 years old. How? How did those work? Number 68. The decline of Minoan culture coincided with the eruption of a volcano on Thera, modern day Santorini in the 16th century BC. This eruption was supposed to be four times more explosive than the infamous Krakatoa eruption of 1883, which in itself was 10,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Jeez. Number 69. I can do this because we're talking about an ancient civilization and it doesn't feel bad. The result, according to some historians, was that Minoan civilization collapsed after being devastated by the resulting tsunami. Either way, it's believed that the idea of a civilization swept underwater was the inspiration for the Greek myth of Atlantis. Number 70. Speaking, Speaking of the Greeks, Greeks, they were the preeminent European civilization over a few distinct eras. First up, you have Mycenaean Greece from around 1600 to 1100 BC. This was the period of the Battle of Troy, and stories of Mycenaean culture were captured in Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey. Mm. Number 71. But all good things must come to an end, and the decline of the Mycenaean Age ushered in a 300 year long Greek Dark Age. Jeez. Such was the scale of the collapse that there was no written records of this period. 
Even their writing system, known as Linear B, completely disappeared. Wow. Number 72. The next stage That's is known weird. as the Archaic Period, from around 800 to 479 BC. This rejuvenation of Greek culture saw the first Olympic Games held. In 621 BC, the politician Draco introduced harsher laws to Athens, often carrying the death penalty and giving us the term draconian to this day. And in 508 BC, Cleisthenes introduced democracy to Athens. Number 73. The classical Greek age, from around 480 to 323 BC, is bookended by two of the most famous events in ancient history. In 480 BC, the Battle of Thermopylae took place, immortalised in the completely accurate oh. film 300, where a Persian army of 60,000 defeated a Greek army of 300. Oh no, sorry, it wasn't 300, it was actually 5,000. Still pretty good. <laughs> Number 74. In 323 BC, the classic era of Greece came to an end, when Alexander the Great also came to an end, aged just 32. As ruler of the Greek kingdom of Macedon, he created one of the biggest empires in history that stretched from Greece to India. That's two million square miles. He was also never defeated in military battle. Number 75. His death ushered in the final period of ancient Greece, which is known as the Hellenistic period, and it lasted up to 30 BC. It was during this period that a new kid on the block showed up to conquer Greece. Its name was Rome, and its victory in the Archean War in 146 BC meant Greece was now a Roman province. Wow. Number 76. Rome itself was founded back in 753 BC and can be broadly divided into two eras, the Republic and the Empire. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> However, initially it was a monarchy and the last <laughs> king, Tarquin the Proud, was overthrown in 510-509 BC, sometime around then. Pretty cool hearing all the history. This is, uh, I feel like I'm at school. Number 77. Although this might be even more depth than... <laughs> to replace the king, the Romans elected two magistrates called consuls on an the, annual some basis. Of the school. There was also a senate which advised the consuls, and in 451 BC, Rome introduced its first law code, the Law of the Twelve Tables, which laid out rules on things like inheritance, debt, property, and the like. Oh, Number gotcha. 78. In 44 BC, the death of Julius Caesar, who had Caesared power, uh, and declared himself dictator for life, plunged the Republic into a huge crisis and civil war. The winner of that war was Augustus, the first emperor of the new Roman Empire. Mm. Number 79. The Roman Empire reached its zenith on 117 AD, and by this point it included most of Europe. It stretched from modern-day England and Wales, through France, Spain and Italy, and throughout the Balkans, plus areas of Asia and North Africa. Jeez. Number 80. The influence of Rome on Europe was huge. Their language, Latin, was the foundation of several languages, like French, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, and Spanish, among others. Number wow. 81. Christianity became the official religion of the empire in the 4th century, and it prevailed to modern times. A 2015 survey of 15 European countries found on average 18% of the population were church-attending Christians, and 46% were non-practicing Christians. Number 82. The Eastern Roman Empire, based in Constantinople, would carry on until 1453 AD, ruling over modern parts of Turkey, Greece, Italy, North Africa, and the Balkans. In the West, however, it collapsed in 476 AD, ushering in what's generally known as the European Dark Ages. Oh, yeah. Number 83. One of the key players during the Dark Ages were the Franks, and the early ruling dynasty were named the Merovingians. They were renowned for sporting long hair to make themselves seem special compared to their subjects, and a Merovingian who had their hair cut short was not able to rule. Uh, Number 84. Weird of age. Of course, the most famous Frank of them all wasn't a Merovingian, but a Carolingian, and his name was Charlemagne. On Christmas Day, 800 AD, he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor, essentially resurrecting the long-lost title of Emperor of Rome. As head of an empire that encompassed France, Germany, the Low Countries, and Northern Italy, he oversaw the Carolingian Renaissance that drew heavily on and preserved Roman culture. Number 85. But Sam, enough with all the culture. Where's the death, destruction, and war that Europe's famous for? <laughs> Don't worry, I've got you covered, death fans. Let's fast forward to 1347, when 12 ships were docked in the port of Messina. The people on board were covered in huge boils that leaked pus and blood, and a lot of them were dead. That's right, the Black Death, aka oh. the bubonic plague, had just arrived in Europe. Oh, man. Number 86. By the time the epidemic... What a scary time, man. Dark ages are dark. Yeah, this, that is like... I don't envy people from those ages like that what a weird time to be alive it was over by the early 1350s 20 million people were dead Jeez. around one third of the entire population of europe 
The wound oh quarantine God. originates from the Black Death, as sailors in the ports of Venice were held on their ships for 40 days, or a quarantine, until it was obvious that they were healthy. No kidding. Number 87. Wow. The Black Death actually came at the start of another death fest, the Hundred Years' War, which despite the name actually lasted for 116 years, from 1337 to 1453. It was a dynastic conflict between the royal houses of England and France for control over the French throne. Jeez. Number 88. Over the course of the war, the English did manage to take control of the French throne, but ultimately then lost the war and all of their French possessions. Except Calais. But they did eventually lose that too. A certain <laughs> Joan of Arc, a peasant girl who believed God had appointed her to lead France to victory, Calais. <laughs> helped turn the tide of the war before being captured and burned at the stake by the English. Number 89. If that wasn't enough 14th century action for you, this was also when the Renaissance kicked off in Europe. This was a huge blossoming of ideas that lasted until the 17th century. Mm. We're talking the invention of the printing press, all the artists that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are named after, and coming to the conclusion that the sun was at the centre of the solar system. Yeah. Number 90. This boom in ideas and critical thinking helped create the conditions for the Reformation, which began in 1517 when a German professor, Martin Luther, put forward his 95 Theses, which challenged the Catholic Church. Mm. Wow. This led to a split in Western European Christianity between the Catholics and the Protestants. Number 91. And Europe is really good at dealing with differences of opinion and everyone learned to live with each other, which is why there was a little thing called the Thirty Years' War between 1616 and 1648. This largely Catholic versus Protestant throwdown led to 8 million deaths and the resulting Peace of Westphalia is credited with laying the foundations for modern nation states, which fixed borders and sold responsibility for what happens within those borders. Jeez. Number 92. If one golden age of ideas wasn't enough, between 1685 and 1815, Europe entered the period of enlightenment. This was centred on questioning authority and trying to improve human society with rational thought, like the idea of separating church and state, Newton laying down scientific and mathematical genius in Principia Mathematica, and Voltaire arguing that everything could be explained rationally. Huh. Number 93. One so, so finally, like, it's, it's funny when you see the, all that history laid out, right? Especially Europe, right? Wow, what a wild history. I'm sure after some, you know, just crazy, uh, bloody times, this uh, period, finally getting to 1700s, things start calming down. Let's think rationally, right? That, let's do things uh, a little more civilized and uh, not go to war for, you know, 100 years, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's cool to see like the uh, the evolution, trying right? Trying to improve society led to quite a big change. The French Revolution of 1789 that led to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which held that men are born and remain free and equal. It wasn't all good, as during the so-called Ten Month Reign of Terror, starting in 1793, a minimum of 17,000 people were executed for opposing this revolution. Jeez. Number 94. So it wasn't done yet. In 1799, the revolution came to an end, when a certain Napoleon Bonaparte took over power from 1803 to 1815, and France waged the Napoleonic Wars, dominating much of the continent. It took a huge coalition of nations to stop him, and after four million deaths, he was finally defeated and sent to live in exile on the tiny island of St. Helena. Wow. Number 95. Not to be outdone, the British had a revolution of their own, only not quite as violent. The Industrial Revolution from around 1760 to 1840 spread across the continent and the world, changing the economy forever. No longer would things need to be made by hand, it was mass production time. Mm. Engineers like James Watt and Matthew Bolton introduced steam engines to a variety of industries, and the steam locomotive made its debut in 1804. Number 96. 1804, I still it can't believe be that. It would be remiss wow. to make a video about Europe and not mention colonialism, with several countries setting out to take over the world, or at least very large swathes of it. It's generally considered to be the Portuguese who got things underway in 1415, when they conquered Ceuta in Morocco. Number 97. Over the next five centuries, Europe will go on to colonise virtually every country on the planet, either directly or indirectly. That's by crazy. By some estimates, only five countries were left untouched by European colonialism. Jeez. Thailand, Liberia, Japan, and the two Koreas. The death toll from European colonialism That's is estimated mind. to be 50 million people, and that was just in the 20th century. Wow. Number 98. Oh my god. When Europeans weren't invading and Oof. killing the rest of the world, they got back to doing what they do best, fighting each other. Which is a really flippant way of saying that <laughs> World War I began in Europe. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary in 1914 triggered a set of competing European alliances that sparked a global conflict which killed 17 million people. Number 99. The Spanish Flu was a global pandemic that started in 1918, That's which right. infected 500 million people worldwide and killed between 20 million? to 50 million people. Now you might think it began in Spain, but you'd be wrong. The first known case originated in the USA, but the flu ended up getting its Spanish moniker as Spain was neutral in World War I, and thus there was minimal press censorship, and oh. so it could openly report the deadly pandemic. See? 
that is, I never knew that. The Spanish flu originally in the U.S. What the hell? And then, obviously, World War I, crazy time. Wow, I did not know that's how the name came about. I also didn't know it was that deadly. Holy smokes. That was relatively recent, considering all the history we've just covered. Um, that was only 100 years ago. Number 100. Yikes. In 1939, Europe went back to war again when Nazi Germany, led by Adolf Hitler, invaded Poland and subsequently conquered much of the continent. By 1945, an alliance of Britain, the Soviet Union, the USA, and several other countries had rolled back the Nazi Empire, but not before 60 million people had died in Europe and throughout the world. Jeez. Number 101. Anyway, that's enough about war, let's talk about a weird cheese. Casu Marzu is a unique cheese from Sardinia that's banned in America and the EU, and you can kind of understand why. This cheese is made by introducing fly larvae into pecorino cheese, letting the larvae hatch and eat the cheese. This makes it soft and you're supposed to eat it before the maggots die. I don't know why. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, man. <sighs> yeah, I won't be uh, ever at a testing, uh, a taste testing for that cheese. Um, yeah, not my thing. That is funny that it's actually banned in the EU and the US. How often do you hear that? Not very often. Usually things are either back and forth, allowed in one place, banned in another. Uh, with the most being allowed in the U.S., banned in the U. Unfortunately, that's like the trend. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that one we can agree upon. That was 101 facts. Wow, it actually went by pretty quick. Uh, I, I think um, that was awesome. It was fun, very interesting. A, a bit of a school lesson towards like the um, late middle, towards the end there with the history. Uh, it was somewhere like Europe, right, on a, on a world scale, like you could do a thousand and one facts. Uh, so you know what I'm saying? Like there's so many things you could do. And uh, I honestly, I wouldn't even want to make a video like this just because how do you choose 101, right? Uh, so at some later date, you know, I would love to do more facts videos uh, about Europe just because I feel like there's so much more you could do. And of course, you know, if we're being really technical, you could do 101 facts for every single country. <laughs> you could do 101 facts for a lot of cities in Europe. So yeah, I would have liked to have seen uh, maybe some more, I don't know, like present day facts just that we can kind of more relate to. But yeah, it was really, really fun. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that. I hope your weekend is going to be awesome. It is Friday, so uh, I'm excited for that. That's about all I got for you on this one. Hopefully you enjoyed a snack or, or a drink during that. We made it through 101 Facts. My name is Ian. You're watching IW Rocker. And until next time, y'all, catch you later.